our planet is full of life. People, places, and animals. Inspiring filmmakers to explore. Finding new stories. Taking us on journeys of discovery into our natural world. This is Wild Lives. For me, nature is a place where I can escape to. You just exist there and then, it's mindfulness. I can completely lose myself in the smallest detail. And I come out of the ocean like as a new person. I grew up in Bulande, which is uh, a small archipelago off the western coast of Norway. It's quite isolated in many ways because you have to take the ferry from the mainland and then drive from island to island to get to the island where I grew up. It's a small but thriving community where everyone knows everyone and it's very safe. Most of the people here work with something that has to do with the fisheries. There's quite a few big fishing boats in the village and they go all the way up to the north of Norway and they fish for herring, cod, mackerel and saith. So growing up here is, I guess, a bit different from most other childhoods. Growing up here, the ocean is a big part of our life. But I think I was the one that was definitely the most interested in nature. I don't know why, but that's just how it was. I was always very interested in insects and the stuff that drifted up on the beach. And I had my huge collection of spiders. <laughs> so I was always a bit different. So the challenge of Growing up in a small place like this is that you don't always have someone else that shares your interest. I didn't have anyone else that was really keen on nature the way that I was, so I was doing a lot of stuff just on my own. So moving away from the islands and studying my passion, marine biology, was really good because then, then I met everyone else that were also interested in nature, so I wasn't the outsider anymore. Being somewhere else, learning about nature and coming back here and seeing everything that we have here, it just made me appreciate it so much more because I didn't realize when I was a kid how special this place is. I think that most places on land have been explored by humans by now. But in the ocean, there's so much left to explore. And no one has seen these sites before. So I'm the first one to explore them and it's so exciting. A lot of people think that there's not much to see in the colder waters here in Norway and Sweden but you have schools of fish, you have anemone walls, you have nudibranch, bright colors, fascinating animals. There's so much to see, even just when you go snorkeling. But I'm scared that all this is going to be lost. So one of the major environmental problems that we're facing now is there's so much litter, especially plastic, ending up in the oceans every year. And it's a huge problem. A couple of years ago, I went for a walk here on the island 
and I found a dead gannet. They had a rope around its beak, so it had starved to death. I picked it up and brought it home, and I assembled the skeleton so that I could exhibit it and show people what the plastic in the ocean does to the animals that live there. So a lot of plastic end up in the ocean. It breaks into tiny pieces and then animals eat it because they mistake it for food. So it's going to have a lot of consequences for us as well because the tiny pieces of plastic that are covered in pollutants they return to us through our seafood and it's going to affect our health in the future. So I get frustrated, I think, when people don't care about nature because if someone throws plastic in the ocean, it's going to have a consequence for all of us, even for our children and grandchildren. I think a lot of people have lost their close connection to nature. Even people working with nature and in nature and depending directly on nature doesn't always appreciate it for what it's worth. I mean, we are so dependent on it and we all sometimes take it completely for granted. But as long as people are not able to see what's there, they're not gonna care so much about it and so that's what I try to do get to get people beneath the surface. The projects that I work on are focused on what we call Nær Natur in Norwegian. So Nær Natur describes the nature that surrounds us every day because I think that people are more likely to connect to that nature and if they connect to it and appreciate it that they are more likely to want to protect it. I made a couple of films about marine litter to tell people about how serious this problem is and also try and inspire them to find solutions for the problem. And last year we made an outdoor photo exhibition to show people here what they're out to see in the shallows. And so we took photos from the local environment, just under people's floating docks, just outside their houses. When they get the information about what's there, people get interested and they want to try it out. So following the exhibition, three women from the island asked if I could take them snorkeling because they wanted to see for themselves what's there. They're not your uh, typical diver. They've never tried diving or snorkeling before. They've never even tried a dive mask on. So it will be interesting to see what they think of it. I was a bit worried about the snorkeling with the ladies today because it's still only 10 degrees in the water, even though it's June, and it's been really windy. So the challenge was to find a site where I could show them nice enough things for them to get excited about it. But we just came back out of the water and it was a success. They were really happy and they didn't think it was cold actually. <laughs> and they thought it was really beautiful. I think there's nature everywhere, even in a city. But it's really hard to compete with shopping and materialism and TV and all these things. But I think that once you get people outside and actually get them to see what's there, if I can manage to get them fascinated, you know, you can get past the idea that they have that nature is a bit boring because there's nothing more fascinating than nature, I think. There's so many fun things to do and it's so much beauty and uh, so many stories to tell. I don't think there's any point in pointing fingers because people aren't gonna change if you do that. So I try to inform people in a neutral way and inspire them because we, we don't have to give up anything. We just have to change our ways. So I think we should just all try and find a solution together and think about our children and grandchildren.
Nigeria. It has the highest rate of deforestation in the world, but there are still pockets of forest left. In one of these pockets, a passionate team of conservationists are about to attempt the largest primate release ever. With 200 monkeys to release, will they be able to get them all out safely? Beneath Afi Mountain lies some of Nigeria's last primary rainforest. In this wild place, the forest is disappearing at an alarming rate, giving way to cocoa farms. But in this last remaining jungle lives a strange and charismatic monkey. And there are some who are fighting for its survival. We arrived here on an overland trip in 1988. And there was a lot more forest then, there was a lot less people. Cross River State was really a peaceful place with a lot of beautiful forests. And we became more interested in this animal called the drill, which nobody knew anything about. Very little was ever written about it, so we uh, started a program for drills. Every day, a truck makes its way from Drill Ranch into the local village of Buancho to buy animal feed and to pick up their staff who are from the local community. What Peter and his partner Liza started 27 years ago with a few orphaned drills is now a hugely successful breeding program and the time has finally come to release the first group of 200 into the wild. Emmanuel has fed the drills every day for 12 years. He's built trust that will be an important part of persuading them to leave their enclosure. So we are just going to go in and feed them. They like mango, so that's why I see they're making some uh, screaming sound of hungry. Yeah. <laughs> so they always do that when they ha see their favorite food. I feed them three times in a day. Sometimes when we have less food, we give them two times. My favorite drill is, the, is, is Glory. Because she's, she's close to humans, she's friendly. She, she takes what I'm giving her by hand. She always makes a sign that will make you come close to her for grooming. There are as few as 3,000 drills left in Africa. They live in groups of 30, led by a large, brightly coloured alpha male. These smaller groups often band together to form supergroups of over 100, one of the largest group sizes of any forest-dwelling mammal. Fighting is a big part of life in such groups, but no tussle is irreconcilable, and as soon as they've started, fights are usually forgotten. Drill Ranch is the most successful breeding centre in the world for drills, and it owes much of its success to its forest location. Without trees, drills would have nowhere to sleep at night. The nursery was just set up as a, a little example of what people could do here. And it was one of, one of the things I, I loved the most uh, in this place, and is what visitors absolutely adored as well. The idea of doing it was to show people, you know, you can do this stuff our biodiversity and our environment is the mother of everybody here. And we dare not lose it. I'm a nature lover from bed. I always like to play with some little things like butterflies, lizards, and uh, I don't like killing. So and I don't even like eating bushmeat. I've been for years working here, so I enjoy working with the primates. 
my favorite part of the day is when I make sure my animals have food and also have drinking water. It's the first time we are going to release the trees. We're gonna be tracking them, following them whenever they lose. And some of the males are gonna be our colors. For the team to gauge the success of the release, they need to know what happens to the drills in the wild. They've chosen to fit five dominant males with radio collars, as where these males go, it's likely a loyal group of females won't be far behind. It's an important part of such a pioneering endeavour, and ultimately crucial for the drill's survival. Peter heads one final meeting with the release team. As Emmanuel knows the drills better than anyone, they ask his opinion on the potential problem. We have to go through and run all the what-ifs, have backup plans, have people assigned. Do you think they're all going to leave or some will stay in the enclosure? Yeah, if you keep them hungry, they will all follow back. If they have something in their stomach, some will like to stay behind. Okay. Yeah. I mean, people should keep their distance from them, but be there if they decide to start going the wrong way to kind of discourage them, distract them back onto the, the direction we want them to go. Man? Hmm? And if you're challenged by a male? Well, I don't want, I don't yeah, want look people down. to look down. At least run towards and the smile. wildlife sanctuary. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> With the collars fitted and a plan in place, the team need to act fast. Everything now rests on tomorrow, the day of the release. As the sun goes down, the drills go up into the trees, where they spend the night together in their family groups. Most of the drills here have spent their whole lives in this enclosure, and they know these trees well. If the release goes according to plan, tomorrow they'll have the whole forest to choose from. Here, we're going to go. Yes, that's a, those are Peter hopes that Emmanuel will be able to coax the drills out of the back of the enclosure with wheelbarrows of bananas and bread. Everyone else will stay out of sight so as not to scare the drills forming a barrier in the bush. The idea is to direct the drills onto Affy Mountain, far enough from local farms where they would likely cause trouble. With the fence open, the drills are free to leave. All that's left is for Emmanuel to show them the way out. Most of the group was held back by the supergroup alpha male, Atora. Now begins a new chapter for Drill Rush, as there's lots of work to be done to ensure the survival of those drills. Peter is worried about the future. In the end, it's going to be for someone else to carry the ball. I'll carry it as long as I can, it's for others. And whether they do or not is not something I can ensure and finding the people that have the ability to do this is very difficult. You need the passion. You need to be unreasonably optimistic. And uh, you need a huge number of skills. And so those people don't just fall off the tree. And you have to be willing to sacrifice pretty much everything. 
too many people that actually are interested in doing that. Emmanuel's thoughts are with his now wild drills out in their new forest home, who he'll spend the coming weeks tracking. I will be worried I will miss them for walking with them for a long time. I'm going to be there with them, following them wherever they go, identifying them in the morning, the one I've seen, the one I've not seen, watching, following them to see how they will survive in the world. So that's my job. Deep in the heart of Germany, in a land dominated by structure and order, there is a wild place, an untouched forest. And in recent years, some of its magnificent creatures have been making a remarkable comeback. All thanks to the extraordinary work of one tiny creature an architect of something incredible. Natural born chaos. Within the vastness of this managed landscape, there lies a pocket of wilderness where nature flourishes free from the order of the outside world. This is the Bavarian forest Germany's oldest national park. Here, a natural harmony endures, supported by the work of a remarkable human being. Every day, Ranger Mario Schmidt sets off into his native woods. A guardian of this unique place, he has a distinctive approach to his job. Die Ranger sind der Sprachrohr der Natur. Und weil nur wenn man versteht, um was das es geht, dann kann man das auch schützen. Vor allem hier in Deutschland ist so, das muss immer strikt nach Vorschrift gehen und da darf, da muss jeder Baum in eine Richtung sein. Das ist aber in der Wildnis nicht der Fall. His efforts to conserve this wilderness get a helping hand from natural disasters. In 2007, Cyclone Kirill ravaged this region with hurricane force and flattened large swathes of the forest. Winds like this prepare the ground for a destructive insect. Attracted by the scent of the weakened trees, the European spruce bark beetles attack in large numbers. The beetles and its larvae forage channels under the bark. They cut off the sugar-rich supply of the trees. The spruces are doomed. Although weak when working alone, this tiny insect finds strength in numbers. Killing large patches of spruce, they are feared by landowners. So local foresters interfere quickly and remove the infested trees. They lay the blame with the park. Also, this argument is ganz einfach, dass wir den Wald sterben lassen. The bark beetle might seem to be a pest, but behind its destructive behaviour, it has a crucial role to play. What if people like Mario don't interfere in the work of nature? Fungi thrives on trees killed by the beetle, and a new forest begins to grow as the sun's rays once again reach the woodland floor. And it's here beneath the canopy that one of the park's most flamboyant creatures makes his home, the capicale. All his attention is fixed on impressing his judges. He's looking for the right place to stage an audition, the perfect forest clearing. 
Soon after dawn, the curtain goes up and he begins to strut his stuff. Singing loudly, he is determined to attract a mate. Even if the hen doesn't hear his ballad, perhaps she will see his dance. But maybe it just isn't his lucky day. Instead, he's drawn to the many blueberries growing here now as crucial sunlight reaches the forest floor. Since time immemorial, the woods of the Bavarian forest have resounded with the distinctive song of the Capacali. And nowadays, thanks to rangers like Mario, he can still find an undisturbed home on these woodland slopes. Meanwhile, today is an important day for his human guardian. Mario takes a special group of children, junior rangers, out into the woods and teaches them his craft. This is eigentlich schon ihre Zeit. Here he tells them about another little known inhabitant of this magical place. The Nationalpark has ja unsere Eltern gegeben worden und hat sich ja verändert durch die Stürme, die wo stattgefunden haben durch den Borkenkäfer. Aber ich habe nichts gehört. Nein. Und vor was für ein Tier könnte diese Fiede sein? Eule. This is a woodland dweller that also gets help from these natural changes. The ghostly Ural owl is an elusive predator, flying silently among the trees, leaving its prey little chance to escape its deadly claws. In spite of these powers, the owl's queer sound has been absent from this place for many years. Then he was nämlich in Bayerischen Wald schon ausgestorben. Genau. Ich habe ihn noch nie gesehen. Also so schaut jetzt in diese Hobbitskörse aus. Recently, this haunting predator has begun to make a comeback thanks to the efforts of the rangers to preserve its wild home. However, challenges remain. There are still not enough old trees in which to nest, like this beach snag. So, for now, the Ural Owl needs help to repopulate this area. Dass man ihm so große Nistkästen anbietet. In early spring, the female answers her partner's call. And the couple start their mating ritual after the long winter. The male brings offerings of food to his mate. Only if he can find enough vole gifts for her will the female lay eggs. As the chicks don't hatch at the same time, there is little competition for food. While one sibling is already snoozing on a branch outside, the other one still cuddles safely in the box, at least until mum decides the time has come for it to explore its forest home. Made it. Almost. There is danger here on the ground. Lurking in the shadows, a martin on the lookout for a meal. The mother is quick to react and rushes to her chick's defense. For now, at least, the owlet is safe. And only a forest with plenty of dead wood can provide enough prey for her young. Fierce as she may be with her enemies, she remains tender with her chick.
Unlike his wild home, in a sterile managed forest, the little owl wouldn't find logs to help him escape from predators. Once both siblings are up in the canopy, the parents' anxious moments are swiftly forgotten. While the father takes over the twilight hunting, the mum feeds her hungry chicks. If there is some food left over, the grown-ups take their share, but only once their young are full. While the owl family pursue its existence in the forest, Mario sums up the learning of today. The National Park has been changed. Where did it entstand? Naturally, you live there. And these natural habitats are created by a small insect with a big impact. As the next generation, the children need to enlighten the park's visitors about these natural wonders. Hello, good morning. This is the habitat, Katja. The rangers to be share their knowledge about the owl's world through a quiz. Wunderschön ist das. Das ist sehr interessant. In the meantime, Mario continues to guard this natural-born chaos, an island of wilderness so that for generations to come, the untouched forest can thrive freely, day after day, and night after night. The tropical Cuban forests are some of the most naturally diverse habitats in the Caribbean, home to many species found nowhere else in the world. 50 kilometers south of the mainland lies the Isle of Youth. With a history of pirates and gold, this very location inspired the great novels Peter Pan and Treasure Island. But these forests are critically endangered. A crack team of biologists and students, led by Dr. David Bird and Dr. Tony Cadez, are here to help. Their aim, to document the extraordinary range of animals found here, all in the hope of saving this pristine environment before it's too late. This might be a new species. Yes. This might be a new species. Yeah. Yes. With unprecedented access, they're here on a wildlife treasure hunt. Whoa. These dry tropical forests are the last of their kind. They remain largely unexplored and very few people have ever been here. After many hours of traveling, the team reached the remote location. They set up their basic living arrangements with only a small beach hut for company. With just 10 days on the island, the team must act fast. and Dave wastes no time preparing for the day ahead. But as the team make their way into the forest, they discover they're not alone on the island. An American crocodile. At seven foot long, it may only be a small one, but it's still a dangerous animal, and the team proceed with caution. Today we're out in the forest looking for reptiles and we've got an expert, Tony, who's going to be helping us identify them and catch them. The idea is to try and get a full list of all the reptiles that occur on the island. The chances are there are new species to be found, perhaps one of them might turn up here. 
It's not long before Dr. Tony Cadez from Havana University has spotted his first target. He's good, isn't he? He's good. <laughs> Tony is an expert in Cuban reptiles, but even for him, the chance to visit this remote location is a very special opportunity. Not too many studies have been done in this area. We are discovering uh, species that actually haven't been reported for this area for uh, many years, and it's very exciting to find species that uh, for the first time have been discovered in this small island. Having seen how it's done, the team get to work catching any reptiles they can find. In this case, a brown anolis lizard, a very common Cuban species. Leaving the group behind, Tony goes off to see what else the island has in store, with the hope of finding some of the more elusive animals. Meanwhile, deep in the forest, the team are not the only ones on the lookout for lizards. The great lizard cuckoo. Found only in the Caribbean, this is one of the largest species of cuckoo in the world. Its main diet, as the name suggests, is lizards. But no luck this time. As midday arrives, the heat is already taking its toll on some of the team. But perfectly adapted to the Cuban climate, Tony has returned after a successful morning. This morning was actually very productive. And uh, I'm going to show you briefly what we got. We have from lizards, different families of lizards, to uh, different kinds of snakes. First of all, ameba. They live on the sandy beaches. The species character is the long and thin tail, which can turn blue in several populations, even here in Punta Frances. This is a Cuban racer. They are actually so fast that it's not easy to collect. We have to jump on it, literally. They are fast not only for moving, but also for swallowing their prey. We also have one of the most amazing reptiles of Cuba, and it's called the Cuban giant boa. It feeds mainly on small mammals. It feeds also in, it feeds on bats. So this species is quite common within the caves. It's a very representative species from Cuba, the largest boa in the Caribbean. As the evening approaches, Tony presents his findings to the rest of the group. The other species we have here is usually uh, found on rocks, rocky places. Back at the hut, a new cast of characters have emerged. And Tony is still on the lookout. Yeah, here we are. As well as providing the team with shelter, the hut has also attracted a variety of visitors. It was fast. <laughs> but uh, I was faster than, than it. Actually, we, what we are seeing here is uh, the patterns of the juvenile as a red tail and uh, many bands in the, in the body. As the team relax, Tony's made an unexpected discovery. So surprisingly, we got another species of uh, gecko. Another <laughs> species? Another species. What do you think about that? I've never seen any geckos at all before. Well, <laughs> actually, this is uh, the expedition for geckos, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, need to, I need to take it to Havana 
and check it because I don't know exactly which speech is this one. And it could be a new record for this old island, for these small islands. So I think it's important to take a good picture of it. Okay. Okay, let's try with this. Uh... Let's hope he behaves himself. Oh, that, oh David, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> An important part of David's work here is to photograph every addition to the growing species list. This is what you find on this kind of expedition. You get all these new things turning up which people haven't seen before. If it turns out to be a new record for the island, that'll be, uh, that'll be great. Tony's discovery of a new gecko species looked like being the highlight of the expedition until he was top trumped by Cuban biologist Elier Fonseca. You will tell us. I just collected and um, please do the honors. It's a. Uh, it's Let's wait and no, no, see. No, no. Let's wait and see. No guessing. Stop guessing. Diplodocus. Wait. Cadea. Even better <laughs> than Cadea. Suman Fibenido. This is an amphisbena. <laughs> this strange animal is known as an amphisbenid and is neither a snake or a lizard. They live underground and are very difficult to find. Little is known about their biology, and for Tony, this is an extraordinary discovery. Wow, guys. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Wow, guys. I mean,. Wow, this is a wow moment. This is the <laughs> yeah. This is the trip I of the wow you. moment. Yeah. My God. Have you my have you God. seen one before? Yeah. No, no. This is my first one alive. Really? This is my first one alive. That's why I was confused. This is my first one alive. Yeah. This might be a new species. Yes. This might be a new species. Yeah. Yes. I have no idea of of what species of Amphisbena is living here. I have no idea. So me neither. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting this. I mean, no, this is completely no. out of the frame. We know. It's out of the frame. <laughs> Guys, this surpassed my expectation <laughs> by far. Nice one. Good old There are so many reasons to call this trip the big trip. Yeah. <laughs> the trip of the new things. Yes. The new discoveries. For sure. It's really good. <laughs> uh. The expedition also documented many insects birds and mammals. Their discoveries provide valuable data that prove the importance of this threatened location and will hopefully secure its future. Everybody's life on that boat is changed forever because they will never ever forget that. Many years ago, a farmer from south of the border arrived on the Scottish island of Mull. Here, on the eastern edge of the Atlantic Ocean, he discovered a magical place, full of life. I love the sea, I've always had a deep love of the sea, and it all started there, because I immediately, first thing was I had to get back on the sea again. And I did, got a wee boat, and went find all these fantastic animals. You know what a puffin is. Well, I didn't know what a puffin is. I hadn't got a clue in those days. I knew nothing about wildlife at all except what a partridge was. And uh, here we have parrots at sea. Amazing. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I was absolutely flabbergasted by all our wildlife out at sea, just out this way. I mean, you can see, if, all you've got to do is go offshore here a couple of miles, and you can see just about everything you possibly imagine in the British Isles. Then, in 1982, 
Richard had an encounter that changed the fate of the region's wildlife forever. This is the story of the legacy left by that magical moment. I was out there one day sea fishing, funnily enough, not while we were watching, just south of Col, the island of Col. Calm day, and I saw this dorsal fin in the distance coming towards us, and I was a bit wary of this. Now, why would a dorsal fin be heading towards us? A bit unusual. And uh, it came closer and closer and got to the point where I was really quite alarmed. Anyway, I leapt on the roof of the boat, holding onto the mast. I can still feel myself doing it and watch this huge animal come straight under the boat, start the other side and turn and come back. The others come back under and round. I suppose it must have been 15, 20 minutes it spent just circling and going under and round us. So there were two things which staggered me. One was the intelligence of that animal to spend time with us, missing all those monofilament lines, you know, which you could actually see underwater. But more important was that animal had decided to come to me and the boat, because we were stationary in the water, and to spend time with us. And that absolutely cornswoggled me, whatever you like to call it. After this extraordinary discovery, Richard became determined to tell more people about the massive marine mammals swimming just offshore. And vast, I can see him doing it in the wheelhouse, turned to me and said, Richard, you can't do that. No, no, first you must prove it. And that's where it all started, the research. So we had to prove it. To fund his pioneering research, Richard ran trips for visitors to see these extraordinary creatures. And so British whale watching, now a multi-million pound industry, was born. But not everyone supported this new venture. And the tourist board actually tried to close me down for running a con trip off the north end of Mull to go and look for whales when there weren't any whales. It got too big for me, much too big in the end. I couldn't, just couldn't possibly control it. Anyway, I was slowly becoming bankrupt. <laughs> but who cares? As the challenges mounted, it was time for Richard to hand over the reins. So now a new generation is taking up the challenge. My name is Pippa Garrard and I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust. So my role is to go out and talk to people about whales and dolphins, get people enthused about them and uh, encourage people to report their sightings and get involved with the Trust further. I know when I first started as I kind of got hooked and now whenever I'm near the sea I just have to be looking. I just can't be next to the next to the ocean without looking and scanning out to sea. So I think it becomes a bit addictive. <laughs> but there is one animal in particular that Pippa would dearly love to spot. I'm not always on the lookout for killer whales. Yeah. But um the light have you seen the West Coast Green God? No. No. It's like a dream. Pippa spends much of her time educating the public about the UK's only resident family of killer whales, the West Coast Community Pod. But despite her dedication, Pippa is yet to see any of the group with her own eyes. Travelling hundreds of miles from the west of Ireland to Scotland's east coast in search of food, the last British orca are extremely elusive. Out of this West Coast community, there are, there was originally 10 animals identified, but we now think that there are eight. These are animals that have been identified by distinctive markings on their fins, um, and we've been able to kind of track where they've been and what they get up to over the years. And John Coe and a number of other of the individuals were first seen in 1992. There is one individual amongst all the others whose fin makes him unmistakable. So John Co, I always tell the kids, is like a local celebrity. Uh, it's very easy to remember him because of the notch missing out of his dorsal fin. Um, so kind of as soon as you've seen him, as soon as you see a picture of him, you know it's him. However, the future does not look bright for these ocean-going giants. Since scientific studies on them began in the early 1990s, they have never reproduced. Either they're too old, it could be toxins, so things like PCBs build up in their blubber and um, A, cause them to be potentially infertile, but B, they actually, when they have a calf, they would release all the toxins into the calf through the milk. 
so that will then cause the calf to die. There's a lot to learn about them and it's kind of a race against time um, and to try and learn as much as we can and so every sighting is important. Uh, so orca uh, or killer whales. Now if we see orca or killer whales today you will also see me crying because I'll be so excited. Also the only cetacean species that you can tell the male and the female just by sight. So this is the female here in the background, much more dolphin looking sort of dorsal fin there. Whereas this is the male, absolutely huge two metre um, dorsal fin. We don't really get any warning about when they're going to come. We just see them sort of once or twice a season and they can just sort of pop up out of nowhere. So you never know, today could be the day. Sheer water's just at uh, 12 o'clock there, four of them. Waters again. What's going on over here? We're looking for it. Okay. Oh, yes! And again! Oh! So it's in, <laughs> right, so in the middle of the left of the trash niche and mall. And again, and again! He's coming towards us! Yeah. Oh my god, he's massive! Is it? It's John Coe! I've spent the last two years telling everyone all about John Coe. So to actually see him, for him to be the killer whale that we saw, to me, is personally just really... Oh my god! It's John Coe! Oh my god, it's John Coe! Oh my god! <laughs> 34 years after Richard's encounter, it seems a sighting of Scotland's remarkable ocean giants still has the power to change a life. Do you want me to turn it around on you? <laughs> <laughs> now my eyes are filling up a little bit. Stop it. <laughs> oh. What was that, Andy? I'll die happy now. <laughs> This has got to be what I do. I want to tell people more about this because not enough people know that you don't need to go all the way across the world to see amazing animals like we have them right here. One respects the sea. One must always respect the sea. And never think you're better than the sea or any of the animals actually in it. They're vastly way ahead of us, the sea particularly. We're all way to... No, I'm not going to even that. No, no, no. <laughs> Look, I should, it's time I shut up, for goodness sake.